Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Rubbergum Anime Podcast, where August is is dead. He's dead, and so I needed to recruit a new compadre to talk about the animes. And today, I'm joined by the one and only Jen, who has contributed to many a great discussion on the Jams and D podcast, and was, of course, a guest in our Evangelion episode. Uh, I think the the crowning achievement of this podcast series, uh, in and of itself. Uh, just a brief uh, once over. Uh, yes, we only had one episode of this show last year. Uh, blame college, blame Nebraska for that. Uh, and it has unfortunately eschewed some of the plans that August and I had for last year, but, but, but it doesn't mean that we run out of friends who are willing to talk about anime. And of course today, Jen and I are going to be discussing an immensely nostalgic subject. We're, we're going to be talking about the anime, the shonen anime classic, Bleach. And part of the reason we incentivize this is not only because we are longtime viewers of this animated television program, uh, but because Bleach, I'm not sure in terms of the raw technicalities, in terms of the anime being, like, cancelled. I don't know if shows like this are officially cancelled when it comes to Japanese network television, but for all intents and purposes, the Bleach anime ended many years ago, uh, and kind of ended in a weird sort of abridged way because of the way that Taitkubo, the author of Bleach, ended the manga. And then he came back with a new story arc that revitalized a lot of people's attention in the series, the Thousand Year Blood War arc. And now Bleach is getting a revival where they adapt the Thousand Year Blood War arc, and they're doing so in basically four big separate parts and jen and i who have way more investment in this shonen anime than any one or even two people should are going to watch the new ones eventually but we decided we should establish a bedrock episode for talking about our history with bleach bleach overall bleach in the context of culture just because to me, Bleach has always been the kind of outsider popular anime. It was one of the the big three, which might be an alien concept to some people now, because things have moved so far beyond Bleach, Naruto, and One Piece that it's just kind of a bygone era. But back when those were the big three anime, Bleach was the least popular popular i think that's a pretty solid conjecture i can make there it was the one i heard people talk about the least i think probably the one that did the lowest in terms of sales i think that one piece is going to reign over all other shonen anime for the rest of time in terms of cultural significance and naruto really isn't all that far behind it all th things considered but bleach was always a bit of an odd duck but now we're here to discuss it in its entirety and i think we should kick things off by Jen and I discussing our connection to this little show slash manga. I have my manga on the shelf, but I'm not. I'm not going to get it because I'm lazy. But Jen, what uh, what what is your context for the history of you getting into uh one the work of one Mister Tight Kubo? My first experience with Bleach was back when it was still on Adult Swim. I must have been eleven Amen. or twelve. I must have been eleven or twelve. Yep, I was. I would be like, because I was not this type of child, like struggling to keep my eyes open at midnight on Saturday because I kept getting insisted on watching this by my, my best friend at school at the time. I was like, you have to watch Bleach. It's super cool because I'd already kind of gotten into Naruto. And he was like, well, if you mm -hmm. like Naruto, you like this, but you got to stay up all night to watch it. But there's only one episode a week. So if you miss it, you're just screwed. And 12 year old me did not <laughs> think that that was an unfair commitment to make. <laughs> it's a <stupid> thing. <laughs> it's so funny that we like I broadly actually have the exact same experience. And it's so funny that like, like we're technically Zoomers, but at the same time, we're also at the edge of the fringe of the cable TV era. So Adult Swim, to me, was my first exposure to anime, too, is that, I mean, like, my first exposure to anime was Dragon Ball. I remember, like, the entirety of playing um, DBZ Budokai on the GameCube, and that was how I was introduced to the first few arcs of Dragon Ball, because that's actually a decent adaptation of the story. 
But uh, after that, I remember seeing Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood when it first premiered in 2010 on Adult Swim. And I, I funny story is that that show, which I consider to be my favorite work of art of all time, I basically tuned in. I think on episode 28, which if you know anything about Full Metal Alchemist, you know that's the moment where an incredibly enormous spoiler is revealed to you. And I had so little context for what was happening that I just didn't even know. And then after that, after they played Full Metal Alchemist, they would play, um, I, I think another, they would have like adult cartoons. I remember it was always King of the Hill. Was it nine o'clock and nine 30? And then it was like full metal alchemist and whatever else was at like the 10 to 11 block. And then like right before like 1130 where I live, that was where I got bleach. And I, I, I it was another instance of me tuning into, I want to say it might've been like, Oh, what's that one anime only arc where all of the Zanpakuto like manifest into real people. Yeah. That and one. like, I, yeah, it was that one. And I, of course the best way to view that arc of the show is without context because that arc largely kind of sucks after like the first introductory part of it. So I just saw a bunch of cool people with cool character designs fighting each other with cool swords. And naturally I was an 11 year old and I was like, this sounds fucking sick. So naturally the way I acquired the show was I went on YouTube and I don't know if people have a frame of reference for this at all, but like anime just used to be on YouTube, like in its entirety before they really cracked down on copyright so they would all be like mirrored they would have like a watermark on them but you could basically watch the entirety of most shows in the early 2010s and so i remember getting through episode i think i made it all the way through the first like all of the soul society arc and then the rest of it i went on one of those like kiss anime websites and watched the remaining 170 episodes <laughs> over the course of two months oh and God. then yeah that that was basically like my introduction to bleach but that was also like the first anime i ever really watched like a significant amount of it was the first thing that like grabbed me and like, again being an 11 year old that's some kind of the target audience for it but um i think the best way is to just build up from the ground here is to say like okay what is bleach what even is this this show um which is weird just because explaining this in the year of our lord 2023 feels very anachronistic but like a lot of other shonen it revolves around the tales of our singular main character ichigo kurosaki and his friends is his grant his good old gang of misfits basically it's 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 scooby-doo but if it was a shonen uh there's lots of of like supernatural hijinks uh there's i i say that the best point of comparison for it was a uh, yoshihiro togashi's really big breakout project before uh hunter hunter uh, Yu Yu Hakusho. Uh, it has a lot of the same sort of core components and the same kind of punk spirit. Um, I've, I think a lot of the appeal of Bleach comes from the core creator Tite Kubo. And what makes him an interesting creator uh, for a lot of reasons, I think, is that he has an incredible grasp on character designs. And that's really important when it comes to Bleach because Bleach is real, like, aesthetic presence was a real outlier because you know you have one piece in naruto which are really well themed fantasy worlds that have pirates and ninjas bleach on the other hand has a bunch of characters who are teenagers who are in the modern world who dress like normal kids who go to high school which was kind of a novel concept then and you know you have these like trendy cooler character designs which innately gets people our age to be like oh wow that's cool i want to be like them and then you start watching it and bleach is the story of ichigo kurosaki a young man uh, who can see spirits. He has some sort of psychic inclination, which, boy, howdy, does that go some places later in the story. 
Um, but he is sort of connected to the world in a supernatural sense. And eventually he gets involved with a group group of people called the soul reapers and they are i mean as the name kind of implies the sort of uh you know the shinigami they are the people in this universe who take souls from one stage of existence to the next and they also fight these big scary monsters called hollows and they are you know spirits that have been corrupted or or influenced in some sort of way and infiltrate into the normal world and through a bunch of hijinks with our Soul Reaper character, Rukia, Ichigo ends up becoming a Soul Reaper himself, even though he is still also a normal human simultaneously. And then him and his friends become very involved in the world and its mechanics and eventually its politics and all kinds of stuff. So curious to say, what do you think is the thing that makes this stand out the most in terms of its context within the place of greater shonen anime at least at the time anyway because i think there are a lot of things that make this show incredibly unique this was a time where if you didn't know where to look your choices as far as anime goes were kind of scanned you know you mentioned digging yeah. through youtube for full episodes of bleach i didn't know you could do that i had you know what was <laughs> on Cartoon Network on Saturday morning, which were all toy commercials. Um, what was yeah. on local programming like the CW, which was reruns of like Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, whatever. But you also yeah. had <clears throat> Naruto and Dragon Ball Z reruns still very prominent, at least where I was uh, growing up. And I think what separates Bleach from those two is it you use this word before it has this kind of punk spirit especially through ichigo um he is a protagonist is very different than your usual shonen protagonist um naruto is a prankster goku is a goofball ichigo is a punk we are introduced to him <laughs> in the first episode curb stomping a dude for disrespecting a little girl's grave and it's yep. the best thing in the world and it's it's so funny to see him be so like righteously angry at so many targets and i also have to say um i know that there is a lot of controversy when it comes to the subs versus dubs debate still this has not changed in the 10 years since uh, i watched bleach uh that said i really gotta give props to johnny young bosch as uh ichigo i really think he kills it he does a really great job in the english voice acting uh generally speaking i think the dub is actually pretty great all these characters are really well embodied by their voice actors the dub is all around great that's what i've been watching to prepare for this is the dub and yeah, yeah. props to them but i think that is what separates bleach is it has this um punk spirit in its youths that we follow for the first you know 10 percent of the show before things get really wacky and then when things mm -hmm. do get wacky it constantly has this darker edge than i think the other two naruto and one piece had even when naruto was at its darkest it doesn't get anywhere near what bleach is i mean it's a show all about death in one way or another um whether being a merchant of it engaging in it wrestling with the fear of it or transcending it altogether it is a show all about dying and what happens after it and all the different ways that can happen after it <laughs> it's i i think that that honestly does have a lot to do with it just because when you look at it compared to naruto and one piece those are shows that do certainly have their darker moments. Like I remember shitloads of gnarly body horror in Naruto and One Piece, if you're at all familiar with it, when it comes to like the politics of that world, I feel like past a certain point, you can't enjoy One Piece to its fullest extent until you're older. 
And Bleach feels like one of the few anime that's like specifically designed to go after a specific demographic of not just like kids who would be into shonen anime, but specifically like the alt more emo inclined kids, not because it's like inherently a very broody show. Like you go back and watch this and it's especially that first arc is really kind of colorful and really humorous and really imbued with a sense of like modern Japanese culture. It reminds me a lot of the Persona games, specifically Persona 4, um, which has a very similar sort of course set up with like, you know, the adorable cartoon side character, the uh, living in the small Japanese East town uh the supernatural hijinks it's all very similar but i think the the coolest part of it is definitely the style there's nobody who draws characters and draws characters in the specific environments as well realized as they do quite like kubo does that's one of his greatest strengths as a manga because that throughout the entirety of bleach it has this really arresting art style that you're not fully inundated with at the very beginning but once the more supernatural elements make it into the show like once they go into the soul society once you get into places like Waco Mundo the show becomes like you know it, it properly kind of artsy with its visuals and it's really really cool to look at and when you're a kid and I remember getting to the Hueco Mundo arc and everything from the character designs to locations in that is so fucking weird looking like you're just looking at all this shit and it's like this is closer to shit you would see in like an Alejandro Hodorowski comic book than you would like a shonen anime thing so it has an appeal that I feel like is very much in its own lane even though it does start in a very comparatively kind of grounded place and i think one of the cool things about going back to watching this uh, especially watching it in its hd form which i did not watch it originally and because it was not in hd on the internet back when i watched this shit um but one of the cool things i got to go back and explore was the fact that watching this in hd now uh, a lot of the animation just looks a lot better uh, Bleach's sort of earlier episodes definitely have a more limited budget because you can tell that they were like, oh, let's see where this goes in terms of success and then maybe we'll give you some money because that was how anime worked back then. You don't have, you know, the first season of Attack on Titan coming out and having a bajillion fucking dollars thrown into it to make it look like the best thing you've ever seen. It's like, nah, the animation in the first arc of Bleach is pretty rudimentary. That said, it's still very heavily stylized. It's still very interesting to look at. There's a kind of... I don't know, like like a wornness. There's some sort of like rough edges in this style that feel very personable, that feel very like hazy, that feel very weird. It's stuff you wouldn't see being more popularized to like way more niche anime, like way down the decade, like the Monogatari series. Obviously they execute that with a little bit more verve, but that's what I think anchors a lot of the first parts of Bleach is that it has a really particular art style. It doesn't quite go as far as, say, Yu Yu Hakusho, where you have all those, like, Shinbo-esque lighting things going on. But still, for its time, it was certainly very ahead of the curve. But um, I think the best way to break this down is that we have some overall bullet points we're going to cover, but we do want to talk about the the various arcs of this show um and i think one aspect of bleach we have to be very upfront about and we have to kind of cast aside just for the time being maybe we'll talk about these things later depending on how this goes but um bleach is also something that's the victim of a phenomenon that existed in a previous era and that being filler uh, I feel like the kids filler. these days who watch anime, they're they're not as well acquainted with filler as people like you and I, because filler is something that as a concept happened when a show became so immensely popular that basically the companies producing them couldn't afford to not have them airing in some respect. So they would just get a team of people and be like, Let's make up some shit until we can catch up with the manga. If you are at all knowledgeable about the original 2003 Full Metal Alchemist, that is exactly why that show is the way it is, because it starts off being an incredibly faithful adaptation for the first 13 or so episodes of the show, and then after that it is completely made up by the studio that was making it, and that's why they had to do Brotherhood. 
Bleach is different. They don't have separate shows for anything. They just kind of switch off into different arcs uh, occasionally. That doesn't happen at the very beginning of the show, but after the soul, like immediately after the Soul Society, the second arc, this will just go on for extremely long filler arcs that are anime only. And right now, we're not going to talk about them uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, most of them aren't very good. Uh, they Usually they'll get a cosign from the creators being like, yeah, 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 do this, whatever. But um, it's kind of like a lot of non-canon DBZ movies in that respect is that they're just sort of there to fill, I mean, again, to fill time. Like the Bount arc is immediately after the Soul Society arc. And it's like as long, if not longer. And I had no idea about this when I was a kid. I was just wondering like, man, this is really long and it's not as good as the rest of the show. What's happening here? <laughs> and then you go into Hueco Mundo after that. And it's, it's, it's very strange. What I would recommend to people doing who maybe want to get into Bleach or want to revisit Bleach, there are many guides online, especially on Reddit, that just straight up tell you these are the adaptation points of the manga. These are the filler arcs. Skip all of these things. Not only can they be kind of superfluous storylines that they just kind of make up, they also just have some episodes that'll come in and just be like goofy, silly nonsense that's just not particularly fun to watch. I, I think this show has a total of three soccer filler episodes. I... I don't know what the deal was in the 2010s with this. Eureka 7 also had a filler so soccer episode. This has a filler soccer episode. Sure, whatever. But we're going to be discussing the core arcs of Bleach right now, anyway, until maybe we want to revisit other ones down the line. And the movies go into that category as well. They're also, I think, non-canon? Yeah, think. all of them are non-canon. Okay. First things first. Start out with the first arc of the show. What exactly is the first arc of the show called? The Substitute. The Substitute. I don't think uh, they have official titles, works. but I just, I just have a list pulled up and I'm going to go with it. Mm. Perfect. I mean, like, look, if they don't give us a specific name, we got to make up our own. So as we've kind of mentioned with the Substitute arc of the show, this is the most sort of standard shonen anime bit of what we're working with plot wise this is a very urban fantasy kind of contemporary setting ichigo his uh one of his sisters is in danger from uh, a hollow uh he and in order to save her he becomes a soul reaper when rukia a uh, soul reaper who comes in from the soul society is wounded uh almost fatally and she has to give her powers to him and he is what they call a substitute soul reaper who is like they get their powers from someone else and he is still human but he still has a soul reaper powers. He can kind of like go out of his own body. Um, and he has to have like in one very amusing uh, arc, he has to get a substitute soul to go into his normal physical body while he is out of it so that people don't notice that he's gone. Um, and basically he goes around, he fights hollows. He learns about everything. Rukia gradually tries to get back her powers and as the show goes along, we find out more of Ichigo's friends have a connection to the supernatural, either by just being around him or through circumstances of their own. You get characters like Orihime, you get P characters like Chad, a.k.a. Sato, a.k.a. What the fuck is going on with your name, dude? <laughs> um, uh, it, uh, you get uh, Uryu. Uh, who is a Quincy, which is another division of monster hunting people who are extinct for now. <laughs> and uh, basically they all join up with Ichigo and learn more and more about all of this with him. Uh, and I gotta say, I remember rewatching, like, I remember rewatching uh, this and the Soul Society arc just because that's the arc I have the most attachment to. A couple of years ago, I remember, like, watching this, like, on my phone on Netflix at a break at my retail job. Ah, uh, memories. Um, but I remember going back and revisiting it just for nostalgia's sake. And I remember this first part being 
not inherently as interesting to me just because I don't love the whole monster of the week thing all the time. Like typically you've got to do something a little bit more interesting or have something that kind of disrupts the flow of just that whole normal bad guy shows up, stop bad guy, rinse, repeat. Scooby-Doo. And I got to say, I, <laughs> I mean, again, this, this has a lot more similarities to Scooby-Doo than you might realize. Um, is Bleach a better uh, adaptation to, of Scooby-Doo than Velma? Tune Shut into our next up. Episode. Don't bring uh, 2023 <laughs> into this conversation. <laughs> Uh, this is about God, regressing I, I to 2009 to... It was... <laughs> okay fair enough but in the spirit of regressing to then i found that i enjoyed this first arc a lot more than i remembered when revisiting it I... some select problems again some of the animation is a little bit jank and when we go into spoilers I, there is like if kubo is a writer has one glaring weakness it's the weakness of convenience in that if he That's can make something it. a little bit more that yes if he can make something more dramatically interesting he will he just takes the quickest possible route to get there and it's not always the smoothest transition you will understand what i'm talking about as we could go deeper into this but I, I found myself having a lot of fun with the first arc of bleach again getting to reintroduce myself to these characters um remembering how like just i forgot how gay totsky was i i i kind of like that part of the show just sort of existed externally to me and now that i remember it i'm just like damn there's like a i I can't remember the character who like actually is like canonically a lesbian but her totsky or hime it's just like like constantly barrage which just like these three want to be a polycule if there wasn't any like samurai shenanigans happening i i just I, that mm. but, but i like the characters i like the dynamics they have i like the designs of the monsters the hollows i think are they have a really cool aesthetic where they're kind of like the monstrous parts of them are like emphasized skeletal kind of bone stuff and like they get a lot more attention than you would figure like the monster of the week uh designs would in any other anime they'd be really generic looking they'd be really like whatever but these have like really memorable striking and often like super disturbing designs not to mention uh orihime's brother comes to mind the scene where he's like being eaten alive by the other hollows and then turns into one again is like yeah ew but uh what do you what did you think revisiting uh this arc for the first time and i'm guessing a long time I think, because I mean, when I started watching this on Adult Swim, we were like deep in fake Karakura town. So this is really my first time going through anything <laughs> pre um, end of Waco Mundo. <clears throat> and this arc keeps the kind of jagged character design of Kubo's early chapters, but it also keeps a lot of its swiftness. I think another thing, another thing that Bleach has yes. that it kind of loses as it goes on, but in the Substitute and in Soul Society, it has a really cinematic flair to its cinematography. Anime, yes, because it's adapting like a visual medium, often forgets that it is a thing that has a camera that you can do tricks with. And early a, Bleach a has a surprising precedence. amount of camera tricks. Um, that I just found really interesting and nothing that's too overwhelming but compare this to like I don't know I've been watching My Hero recently catching up with season 5 yeah. the camera is practically non-existent in a show like My Hero but in this you feel like the presence of editing you feel the presence of camera movement you feel the presence of like eye lines similar to what Kubo was using in his manga basically using the camera to bring to life what the stillness what it, what's being lost in having to put motion to some of these incredibly compelling stills and it's really successful when it has to pick up the slack in that way and that's what i like about the substitute that's why i think it makes up for in kind of its jankiness is that it takes that jank and gives it a lot of flair through really ana- anachronistic lighting which is another unique flair that I think Bleach has in its early bits is that like you have people in 
weird costumes with weird powers fighting weird monsters on just like normal city streets and like abandoned yes. buildings and apartment complexes which again my hero kind of does that now but no show yeah. at the time really did that sort of thing and it gives it a really unique visual identity where it's like you literally have monsters in the streets which is a really unique premise it adds to that kind of real world relatability that the characters already bring to the table. These environments leave this like innate sense of connection to just sort of see these fantastical things happening in very non-fantastical places, which is a, a concept that I get along with a lot just because like a lot of the fiction that I'm interested in and went on to be interested in is very focused on that very specific contrast. And Bleach does it with a surprising amount of commitment even when it goes on to its later stuff is that it still grounds everything enough to the point where at least when it's trying to like the soul society arc i think does it very well too but it, it just it makes everything feel very grounded in a way that a viewer can easily understand and latch on to and but it also doesn't kind of it, none of it feels like rudimentary or or basic or like there isn't thought put into its construction. It very much is. And I, I completely agree when it comes to the presentation style. I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that Kubo as a mangaka is inherently very cinematic with his language. Like I've been reading some of the Thousand Year Blood War arc uh, in the manga and obviously it's because he's developed like a lot in his style since. But even if you go back to the very beginning, all of these rules and all of these like adherence, like he is a guy who's been like drawing since he was like, you know, a small child. And he's been like supremely talented ever since. And you can very much tell that. And that's not always the case that like some manga kind of like, you know, I think this is sort of pioneered by Akira Toriyama, who I really think feels like the sort of modern blueprint for the the language of the manga and how that is a medium specific, like unique way you can communicate stuff. Whereas Kubo does draw innately from manga stuff, but he also draws from like Akira Kurosawa samurai movies, which you can see the fucking like blueprint of all over this. And another aspect of its presentation that I must mention is one of my favorite aspects of Bleach uh, overall, and that's the fucking music. I have yes. loved Bleach's soundtrack ever since I was a kid and first heard it. And as I go back to it, not I, I still listen to this shit on a regular basis because it's great. It's done by Shiro Sajizu, who did the music for the anime Evangelion. You might have heard of it. But the cool thing about his soundtrack work here is that each arc has a really specific sound, tone, and genre. Like the first part of Bleach and a little bit of the Soul Society is like weird blends of electronic music and post rock a lot of it's really atmospheric a lot of it like like the like the fight scene stuff is like really you know it's really like hard kind of like heavy metal infused kind of stuff but once you go into hueco mundo you get this like latin salsa flair that's put into all of these things like it sounds like francis the mute by the mars volta and it sounds dope as fuck like every single sort of different aspect of bleach every like sort of segment of the story has its own stylized sound and i think that really helps in sort of giving these places and these characters a certain liveliness that makes them feel like they're even more pronounced than the animation kind of already makes them and that's from the get-go i actually think that the strongest set of songs is from uh, the first arc of Bleach. Like, all of those songs, some of them get, like, some replay over the various arcs, but, like, the core of these is just, it's so memorable. Even the filler arcs, like, the Bount arc, like, all of the soundtrack to that sounds like fucking PlayStation 1 Castlevania music, and it's badass. It's It sounds fantastic. If you haven't tracked those soundtracks down and haven't listened to them, highly, highly recommend. Uh, Shiro Sajizu's best work in my opinion uh and he's done some great work over the years but um i i think if we want to get into the weeds a little bit we have to talk about the sort of core dramatic crux of 
the substitute arc to me, which has to do with our main character, Ichigo, and the sort of main driving thing that's sort of pushing him forward, and that being Ichigo's mom, uh, who is dead. Uh, anime characters, Disney characters, dead parents, handshake. Um, yeah. <laughs> um he basically he lives with his dad and his two sisters his mom died when he was a younger boy basically in front of him and we basically find out as the story goes along that he blames himself for her death because supposedly she drowned after going and like walking with him one day and Ichigo kind of like blacks out and doesn't remember what exactly happened but his mom went to like go get him and then ended up dying under slightly mysterious circumstances and this like moment for Ichigo is the thing that ends up driving him even before the you know the soul reaper aspect of his life comes into place that he harbors an immense amount of guilt from it so he tries to to the best of his ability you know right wrongs and injustices that he sees you know throughout his life throughout his existence and then once he gets his substitute soul reaper powers he sort of uses that as a driving force to kind of atone for his sins but not really it's really more of just the guilt complex that drives him to do good things and that's also a really core compelling aspect of his character but there's a bit of a wrench thrown in it in that you discover in one episode that the person responsible for Ichigo's death is not Ichigo Ichigo's himself but death. in fact <laughs> Ichigo's mom's death my bad uh Ichigo's mom's death uh, uh what is responsible for it is a powerful hollow by the name of Grand Fisher and this aspect highlights to me so much of like just what bleach becomes based off of this for so many reasons because it exemplifies why it's both incredibly smart and incredibly compelling and also the weaknesses down the road that are inevitably going to show their face in terms of strengths i really like this because what happens is that ichigo eventually does confront the hollow grand fisher but he doesn't beat it. Essentially, Grand Fisher beats him and then escapes. And the core of this little morality play here is that Grand Fisher is, you know, a, a metaphor stand in for grief. It is, you know, learning to move on. And the thing is, the smart thing here is that Ichigo doesn't get the chance to beat Grand Fisher. He has to live with the fact that he's still out there, which is a direct parallel to how he has to live with his mother's death. It is, a, a, from a writing perspective, it's a perfect parallel of the closure that you don't get. And that's a lot of what has to do with Bleach overall and its themes about death, is that you have to learn to accept it, to move on from it, not only in a personal sense, sense but in a kind of overall metaphorical context. And when it comes to others, you just need to learn to live with it. And I think that that's very poignantly captured. It's also so hackneyed at the very beginning of this episode when they go and visit his mom's grave and then Rookie is just like yo did your mom get killed by a hollow and then it's just like whoa, whoa wait a second whoa, where the fuck did this come from dude like this is never hinted at this is never foreshadowed like Rukia just finds out his mom is dead and immediately in record time it's just like I bet a hollow did it. And then it's like, yeah, she turns out to be right. But also, like, you couldn't have thought of maybe a bit smoother of a way to introduce this plot point. Like, just the teeny, eeny, weeny bit. That is a problem with the whole series, really, is that Kubo has good ideas for these characters. But for the Great most ideas. part, the mo for the most part, I wouldn't say he fails, but it's always kind of clunky the way things are elaborated on or fully resolved. I think about something that happens in Soul Society. Multiple times, someone with an important dead family member ends up running into the person that killed said important family member. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
both of which are good reveals, but it's yes. the same reveal. <laughs> and in, in the context of the story, these reveals work. And it's like, look, as a writer and as someone who, I'll say it here, shamelessly took a lot of beats from Bleach in his own story, um, I understand, I, at least in theory, how Kubo operates in that he has these ideas for these singular moments and singular character beats that are really well thought out, really well constructed and interesting. He just has no idea how to get there. He has the A, he has the B, and the A and the B are great. They're they're the best A and the best B that you'll ever see. But the line that goes in between them is often like, oh, here, we, oh, shit, fuck, here, we, and we got there. And sometimes it doesn't always work. And this doesn't really shine through in many moments in the first sort of substitute arc is because this is a kind of, you know, slowly showing you all of the elements that are in this world. We get uh, characters thrown in like uh, Kisuke, for example. Eventually we get um, one of my favorite comedic character reveals in the form of the black cat, Yoruichi. Um, yeah. <laughs> I we'll get to that more when we get to the Soul Society, but I I just like you know for like thirty odd episodes, it's just this tiny little funny little boy cat character, and then, then it's <laughs> then it's not later, and we'll we'll get to that when we get to that. But you get a lot of really interesting moments of like you feel like you're discovering this world in Meteor Res, and that there's lots of very specific elements of like. Like, once you find out who, well, you don't really find out who Kisuke is until much later. But when you find out that he's, like, this guy who owns this, like, smuggling underworld items shop, and he also runs it with, like, these other people that he knows, and you're just kind of like, what's the what's the story here? Who is Kisuke? How did he get here? Like, why is he here in the first place? How is he able to get all of this stuff from the Soul Society? And the reveal that that pays off with is fucking awesome. But it, it's great at setting up all these questions, all of these characters. I, I love the core dynamic of like Chad, Ichigo, Orihime, and uh, Uryu. They're, they're a great sort of core central cast that plays off of each other really well. Ichigo's this kind of like he's just a very real feeling teenager he doesn't like slot very neatly into an archetype or a is just a weirdo like i i the earliest i ever remember encountering a character who i would confidently label as being aggressively autistic <laughs> in, in the most charming way possible i i love her to death she's incredibly funny uh Uri is this kind of no nonsense kind of glasses push up <laughs> character who takes himself way too seriously and nobody else does and that's great and then there's chad who is just the biggest sweetest boy who i just want to give so many hugs to what a what a lad that little episode where he protects his little bird friend is so adorable yes i was and just thinking about that's... that episode <laughs> Where he's just stuck with a bird. Introducing a character <laughs> when the fucking metal pipe just falls on him. And then he just, like, he's sitting there, like, with blood, just, like, fucking, like, bleeding from his head. But he's just like, don't worry, I'll get you home. It's like, it's so sweet. I love him so much. He's such a sweetheart. And all of this kind of comes to a head is that they're kind of hinting throughout the progression of the show, especially when the Ichigo's mom episode comes in is that there's also another soul reaper who's sent there to retrieve Rukia because basically you find out that giving away your powers as a soul reaper is a huge taboo like a huge fucking don't do that big no no bad 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 and so basically the soul society is like out to get her now because Ichigo having soul reaper powers is bad and so she's able to kind of ward them off temporarily until two soul reapers show up who've been hinted at and like end the episode stingers previously but we don't really know them but both of them have rad as fuck looking character designs you know we got renji who's got the fucking face tattoo and the fucking red Gnarly hair red and hair. yeah byakuya mm -hmm. byakuya who's i don't know what the fuck his hair is but like byaku just looks like a stone cold motherfucker and then they show up and another great thing the show has going for it at least towards the start of it is they have like a WWE grasp 
on jobbing their characters so that you know how strong other characters are really, really well. Because Ichigo grows a lot in the substitute arc. He can do a whole lot of shit, and even Ruki is like, damn, this motherfucker's powerful. And then he fights Renji. And if you know anything about Bleach, <laughs> Renji does not win a lot of fights. <laughs> Let's say that much. But Renji annihilates Ichigo the first time they encounter each other. Like, it is just a complete fucking wash. It's just terrifying. Absolutely just... <laughs> like, you think Ichigo is about to die. Like, and for all intents and purposes, he absolutely is. And then they steal Rukia and take her back, and basically she's committed treason. So it's implied that, like, they're gonna execute her, essentially. They're gonna take her back to the Soul Society, and they're going to kill her. And Ichigo is left there. And then, but, you know, Ruki is their friend now. And I also need to mention, I didn't mention that Ruki is also a core like member of this group. I love Rukia as well, especially in those first couple episodes, because she is also an unrepentant goofball. Like she's the fish out of water character who is very serious and has a lot of serious things going on. But gradually as she starts hanging around people, she just kind of learns how to have fun. And you just sort of get the impression that this is the first time she's been able to cut loose in like a hundred years. And so when she gets to... Thank you. So <laughs> the, she may or may not have a certain similarity to a character that uh, I may have written uh, a certain British character who Jen might be aware of uh, that I that I only made the connection when I rewatched recently. But it's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm choosing. I, it's to, fine. It's fine. I'm choosing to mince my words because I've been neck deep in Kubo and you, and I'm making all of the connections <laughs> in my brain. <laughs> Trust me, won't be the last. Um, if you're if you're wondering what we're talking about, I have a book series, and it was not my goal to plagiarize elements of Mr. Tight Kubo. And it's different from it in a lot of ways, but you could read that and certainly be like, this is certainly bleach inspired. Um, but uh I do love Rukia as a character. So when she gets taken off to the Soul Society at the end of the substitute arc. Um, it's kind of like, oh shit, this sucks. So at the very end, Ichigo, you know, he gets up because nothing's ever going to keep that motherfucker down. He, he, I, in terms of anime characters taking punishment, I don't think I've ever seen a character get as constantly eviscerated as Ichigo Kurosaki. Just every couple of episodes, this dude is at, at death's door constantly, just beating the hell out of, and he... And his new friends, and they're just like, okay, we're going to go see Kisuke. We're going to see what's up. We're going to break into the Soul Society, and we're going to save Rukia. And it's like, hell yeah, this is cool, man. Let's go. And that brings us to the Soul Society arc. And this is... Peak the one, is ladies peak and gentlemen. This shonen, is this man. is it's this is so peak. good. I I adore this story arc as much as I adore any story arc in any other piece of fiction that I love. This is the like uh, it's it's not quite at the level of Hunter Hunter's Chimera Ant arc, but I will be damned if it's still not close. This is the thing that feels like when you're a kid watching the show and you don't really pay attention to the amount of episodes that this takes up, this feels like it's 200 episodes because it feels like this big epic thing because before it does such a great job of grounding you in the reality of Karakura Town, uh, grounding you of the reality of that urban kind of contemporary Japanese setting. So you feel like those moments of the supernatural incursion are kind of just that, moments. So this is... Excuse me, Jesus. So this is the first time where you're going headfirst into all-out supernatural shenanigans. And so Ichigo has to prove himself to Kisuke by doing all this shit and, you know, raising his power level and all that nonsense. And then they break in and they all get in a cannon and the cannon shoots them into the Soul Society. And they all have to, like... The cool thing about it is that this arc the main character of this arc is not any one character the main character is the setting the main character is the soul society you're introduced to this place all of its people all of the soul reapers all of the 12 
captains, the 12 lieutenants, the fucking um, all of the different like seated chairs of the different squads and stuff. You find out so much about so many different characters and you sort of explore this sort of like kind of feudal Japan setting that this is inspired by. Everything is again, it's very samurai-ish. Um, it's very, uh, it's kind of like, oh, what movie am I trying to think of? It's like uh, Harakiri is the, the the movie I'm trying to aim for in terms of like its caste systems and what have you and the sort of hierarchy of this whole society and the connections all of these characters have to one another. And one of the cool things about it to me from the outset is the fact that everyone is completely aware of the fact that they are like the underdogs, that they are fighting a bunch of people that are way more powerful than they are and that they need to be careful. And so they basically go through this little spy network of outsiders that sneak them into the soul society illegally. And it feels like all the tension here is so palpable. And so you have all of them learning about where they need to go, where Rukia is being held, and you have the ticking clock of her execution coming up. And, and there's also an extra element going on here because it seems like the internal politics of the Soul Society, something is wrong because there's this one captain, Gain Ichimaru, the fucking creepy ass motherfucker who's always smiling and never opens his eyes. This dude keeps pushing to have Rukia's execution closer and closer to the current date, like just keeps pushing it up. And this is strange, this is suspicious. Even people within the Soul Society, people who know Rukia, people like uh, Byakuya's Lieutenant Renji, who is lifelong childhood friends with Rukia, people are starting to suspect that something is off, especially as Ichigo and his friends infiltrate and begin to variously defeat different characters and, and sneak along and go and encounter different people. and. We also kind of have a mystery element going on here because there's one of the captains in the Soul Society, Captain Aizen, who seems to be noticing something going on and has some issues with Mr. Genichimaru and his Lieutenant Momo, uh, who he kind of is another POV character in this arc, who kind of crush it on Aizen just a little bit. She admires him and sees that he's troubled that he's worrying about something and then while all this chaos is going on Aizen is dead dude is mounted to a wall with a sword huge thing of blood going down and Momo freaks the fuck out and everybody's like okay oh, that's um such an evocative shot. so somebody it's it's like and like I remember that moment and like the moment of like the Shiro Sajizu music that plays at that reveal and like the fucking the just fucking her eyes just going Psh! it's it's a great moment and immediately you as a viewer you're just like wait a minute somebody is strong enough to kill a captain who you've basically been able to see how strong these people are as the arc progresses and they are not to be trifled with. Because people like Chad go off and he faces one of the captains who is not supposed to be a very strong captain and gets his ass viciously handed to him. By so a guy who like, doesn't want Oof. to fight him. No, he's <laughs> literally just like, I'm kind of a pacifist. I don't really want to be here. And he just kicks the shit out of him. And it's like, who could possibly be strong enough to kill this motherfucker? This is impossible. So... All of these wheels are turning. And as they turn, Ichigo and his friends get closer and closer to Rukia. You keep encountering these different people. They all have different powers. They all have different strategies for using their abilities. And it makes all of these encounters really great. And the first thing of note that happens, at least to me, when it comes to like all these clashing abilities and stuff, that's cool, right? But the moment where everything dramatically starts to fall on the places when Ichigo fights Renji again is that first of all yeah. Ichigo's a lot stronger he was he so he's not going to immediately get his ass kicked again and immediately you have this dichotomy of Renji who is suspicious of his superiors because he knows something suspicious is going on but at the same time Rukia is his best friend and he is essentially responsible for helping arrest her and put her 
up for execution again. And you find out through some flashbacks and some other episodes and stuff that's like they were poor kids in the Soul Society and they eventually, like all of their friends around them, like just kind of went away and died eventually. And it was only them left. And the only they were strong enough to survive and they eventually became strong enough to be Soul Reapers. And then they got there. And essentially Ichigo, his existence is in direct opposition to Renji because his existence is like Ichigo is going against the authority of the Soul Society. He's fighting all of these powers that be that Renji is essentially assimilated into. And he is going, he knows that Ichigo wants to save Rukia. And so he obviously identifies with that cause. But at the same time, Ichigo's existence is a direct slight against Renji as well. Because if Ichigo and his friends can go and fight the powers that be to save Rukia, then why the fuck isn't Renji? And Renji's just standing there like, but it's because he's making all these excuses, but he's denying the fact that he knows fundamentally it's he's in the wrong. It's the wrong thing to do. And the only way he can prove to himself that he is in the right is by beating Ichigo. Because if he beats Ichigo, then that means that the status quo should remain as it is. That nobody ever had a chance anyway. That Rukia was doomed from the outset. That there's nothing he could have done. And it's tragic, but it sucks. So then Ichigo beats Renji in a phenomenal fucking fight. A great fight where they they're really evenly matched like this is basically the most dire stakes the show has had thus far and then renji just kind of gives up at the end and he's just like you better go save her and it's like this is so smart everything about this dramatically works there's nothing about this that feels kind of like forced or ham-fisted like the stuff with it goes mom did in the substitute part it's purely viscerally dramatic and it works so 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 well Ironically, a lot of Kubo's best moments and character development come through characters that are less relevant to the story or just disappear entirely from it. Um, I think about Renji, you have Komamura and Tosin who have a really strong established relationship at the beginning and that pays off in a great moment way, way, way down the line. And the best thing about Soul Society is that as you meet all these characters, you can draw these really intricate webs of like professional and personal relationships. You have like Renji and Byakuya and their professional kind of rivalry. You have Aizen and Momo and their unrequited love. But Momo is also childhood friends with Toshiro and Toshiro is like best friends with Rangiku who is childhood friends with Gein and Gein is just Gein but that's fine <laughs> um and you have characters who are like best friends like Kyoraku and Uketake relationships that are really never questioned but that so that solid nature works as well like the two of them constantly play off of each other so well and then you have lone wolves like Mayuri and Kenpachi who go through a lot of are fucking insane in in two characters who Kenpachi goes through a lot of development Mayuri does not go through a lot of development and they're good examples of the way Kubo writes characters who can have like their gimmick and sometimes for the betterment of the show stay that way or have characters that are really gimmicky at the beginning and serve a really specific narrative function at the beginning who by the end of the show grow into full spirits i mean no spoilers but kenpachi goes through something in thousand year blood war that is completely yeah. off base from where he was when we first met him in soul society and that long term storytelling is I think the best thing about Bleach when Kubo is able to stick the landing on a lot of these moments and Soul Society has that I mean I didn't remember going through this again how much of Soul Society is just planning and training to have even a scrap of a chance at pulling this off like yep Ichigo and Renji and Chad and Uri were all training for so long and Kisuke is planning for so long for even just a 1% of a chance 
for this scheme to work. And then when they finally get there, they run into all these roadblocks that they have to overcome. You know, just having to sneak around is a challenge in itself. But then you meet characters like um, Ikaku, who in the very beginning when we meet him, it's just like, all right, this is a criminal. I'm going to murder him. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty much all we know about the guy. But you see, like, in that fight between Ichigo Ichigo and Ikaku, you see a lot of his philosophy and how that is reflected in later moments with him. And that's what Kubo is really good at, which is giving these characters really strong relationships and really strong senses of self that are either questioned heavily sometime later in the series or are never questioned and can become increasingly endearing or increasingly frustrating on a case-by-case basis. <laughs> yeah, the the whole Soul Society feels like a fantastic network of characters where it feels like Ichigo and his friends are only a very small part of. There's so many cogs that are moving in this. And later you even kind of discover that Ichigo and his friends are sort of being not used but still like they are being like kisuke and yoroichi kind of have some sort of long-standing beef with the soul society that they're trying to sort of kind of put to rest with all this and also this is when the character uh reveal of yoroichi happens uh where uh you know he, he the, the cat travels with them and then it is revealed that yoroichi is actually and like the hottest woman ever uh, and helps uh, teach Ichigo some more sword techniques with um, various levels of clothing. Uh, and Yoroichi also has one mm-hmm. of my favorite long-standing relationships with another member of the Soul Society in that being that she and Soifone, they they love each other so much, except, well, I mean... <laughs> Soyphone's a little angry at the very start that Yoruichi abandoned her. <laughs> and there's some there's some feelings there that are very um that there there there's a little animosity at the very beginning there, but there's um they they mm, the the fights in this show to to various extents of success as the show continues last a very long time. And occasionally it's used to great dramatic weight where it just sort of feels like every blow is calculated. Every single bit is just so pre-planned out and like everything has to be careful and considered. And the fight with Kenpachi, I think, is the best example of all of this. And as we go along, we get a series of various reveals that just kind of make all of this even better, is that you find out that there's essentially a shadow government that runs the Soul Society, that sort of keeps the Soul Reapers in check, that's like basically the equivalent of the Soul Reaper Congress. And then when things get weird, some characters go to check on them. And they're all dead. They're Every all single one of them. Dead. <laughs> fucking massacred and you're just like what the shit is going on and like every step of the way Ichigo's just getting closer and closer and closer to Rukia and Rukia who is like long given up hope eventually discovers that Ichigo is coming to save her and is just like just trying trying to hope to find it in her that maybe that he will be able to stand up to the powers that be and save her And as things keep going, you're just kind of discovering that everything is beginning to unravel. And that, yeah, Genichimaru is definitely not a good dude, but there is way more than just him being a bad egg happening here. And then eventually, Momo, one of our essential POV characters, is fucking murdered. And not only is she fucking murdered, she's murdered by Aizen a character who we thought was all dead. Like there is like, this is legitimately one of my favorite plot twists in anything ever, because there is no information beforehand that could possibly allow you to guess that he is still alive. Well, like, no, none at all. what happens, it goes a step further. Aizen reveals himself to her or no, I, I can't remember how it happens, but somehow she's convinced that her childhood best friend Toshiro is the one who yes. kills him, and she just goes after him <laughs> and almost kills kill him. 
And eventually, uh, Toshiro, who's just kind of like, what the fuck is happening? Is also like everyone basically discovers the fact, like at the very, very end, which basically the the end game final boss for this arc is Byakuya. Like Byakuya is the dude who, with alongside Renji, initially took Rukia. We find out that Byakuya is Rukia's older brother, uh, adopted older brother. A uh, lot of family history with them uh, going on. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of characters in this show who just resemble other character. characters in inexplicably, like. We haven't even gotten like to Rukia our, our looks... third and fourth uh, super complicated organizations. <laughs> <laughs> the super complicated organizations, and I believe there's, in theory at least, there are like five different versions of Ichigo, including uh, uh, Rukia's old squad captain who inexplicably looks exactly like Ichigo. And there's also a palette swap of Ichigo character who's just him with black hair. And then there's hollow Ichigo. And there's... <laughs> There's a lot of Ichigos is what we're saying here. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Oh, good lord. There are a lot. But um, essentially, it's all revealed after the fight with Ichigo and Byakuya, who eventually he does defeat. uh, Who Byakuya has the coolest Zanpakuto like in the whole fucking show by the oh way I just God. I the the fucking com, like when he says like I, I just remember as a kid when he just goes scatter and I'm like now what the fuck does that mean and then it just turns into a tornado of soccer of blossoms that are all swords and you're like oh that's oh that's the coolest thing I've ever seen that's that's so dope that's so cool and Ichigo still manages to beat him but we find out that Aizen, who has been planning this for so long, that he hid his Zanpakuto, which the Zanpakuto is, it's every Soul Reaper sword that all has an individual unique power to them. He hid its real power because its actual power is being able to like shift reality and fool people into thinking something else. So basically he used that power on everyone so that everyone thought he did something else and used that power to fake his death to hide. And then at the moment of Rukia's execution with which would be used to like a giant super weapon would be used to kill her. He uses this moment to be able to steal this giant super weapon, take all of the people who are working with him, who include Captain uh, Genichimaru and uh, Captain Tosen, who were both traitors. They sneak away with him and they ascend into another plane of reality and leave all of the other soul rapers behind. And essentially it just like, you know, Ichigo, who beats Byakuya at this point, who's one of the strongest captains, you're just like, oh shit, maybe he'll be able to take on Aizen. Aizen blocks his sword with a single fucking finger and then just bounces and he leaves. Barukia is saved. Everyone is there. Ichigo is quasi accepted as a soul reaper, kind of, sort of. And for the most part, everything is like, okay, well, now Aizen, Tosin, and Ichimaru are gone. We don't know what they're doing, what their next step in their plan is, but this all led us here. And now we're all just kind of like all right i guess we can go back to the normal world we'll still fight hollows and what have you and you know because of all this rukia is saved and she is allowed to live and it's like what a fucking journey (laughs) this is again just good from beginning to end this is exactly what you want to happen you get a satisfying mystery you get incredible fight sequences you get great development for the characters there are a couple tinier issues I have that are real microcosms for Kubo's writing weaknesses later on that being my homie loves deus ex machinas he really loves them and like lots of writing terms a deus ex machina is neutral it can be used well and it can be used poorly however in a lot of core conflicts of the soul society there are moments, for instance, the fight with uh, Mayuri and Uryu. That's which, exactly the one I was again, thinking of. <laughs> from, an em- from an emotional standpoint, 
this works super well for Uryu as a character. And it's really tense until the very end where Uryu just pulls this thing right out of his ass. And I just, I feel the need to explain the logic of it. My Yuri's okay, power, yes. my Yuri's power is basically paralysis, and mm-hmm. Uryu reveals a secret Quincy power that he literally, almost exactly describes as anti paralysis, where he can use the spirit <laughs> energy of his body to overcome the limitations of his own nervous system. <laughs> and it's like, okay. I sure like we're 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 dealing with a lot of variables and a lot of powers and if you need to rely on that a couple of times I get it to some degree when you're dealing with a magic system that's this diverse and has so many rules that's understandable uh Ichigo also kind of does this a couple of times but it's a little bit more well built up there's also um the fact that all Zanpakuto basically have a spirit inside them and Ichigo becomes very well acquainted with the spirit of, is it Getsuga Tensho? Is that his name? Zangetsu. Or Zangetsu. No, Getsuga Tensho is the name of the technique. Zangetsu. He becomes very well acquainted with Zangetsu. And I need you all to remember that because it is going to be very, very, very important later on. Uh, but he becomes very well acquainted with Zangetsu and the hollow version of himself, which he has to defeat. It's It's more well built up, but as like a when it comes to ichigo's power scaling this is pretty much the peak of when it becomes dramatically satisfying past this point that's a little bit shoddier i think that later on they kind of rectify this in one of the later arcs but it's 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 a bit hit and miss i i do still like how overall like orihime's powers are really diverse and they let her be particularly useful throughout the duration of the arc uh my my one of my bigger complaints is that i i think poor chad gets jobbed so hard that he just kind of gets unfortunately sidelined would have liked a little bit more of him um but i mean somebody's got to do the the heavy lifting when it comes to power scaling so mm, but these are all such minor things in an arc that if I was rating these arcs on an individual level, this is like the tenniest 10 I could possibly give. It's 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 such a fundamentally fantastic and colorful, like just piece of storytelling. And then Waco Mundo we move on. Waco Moon, which is weird because in my head, there's a lot of filler between Hueco Mundo and the Soul Society. And you're today. correct. Like, a lot of it. It is. It is there. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it, yes. And you go straight from that into Hueco Mundo. And it does sort of feel like if you skip all the filler, there is a kind of like, whoa. <laughs> Feels like things just got a lot bigger really suddenly. And this is where Bleach starts to encounter some problems i don't it's weird just because i don't feel like we're challenging the consensus too hard on bleach because like it's generally accepted that the first part of bleach is great and that most people love the soul society Hueco mundo a bit more divisive i think i think there are certainly the show's fans that stand up for this arc but there's also has its notable detractors and lots of people who just kind of hey, um, this is just Soul Society again, and it's not really as good. And from a broad standpoint, yeah. My reservation yeah. is that just doing Soul Society again is not inherently a bad idea. No. It's just no, how not all. they get there feels really contrived and feels like you're trying to do soul society again in every respect like Ichigo has to learn a new power before he's going to be strong enough to go in there so he has to meet with this mysterious group of characters who might have ulterior motives for him one of his friends is kidnapped so he has to go rescue her which is a fine motivation in soul society but just going after Aizen I feel like is motivation enough that you didn't need to 
do that yeah to I, i'm still kind of unclear as to why orihime was really kidnapped in the grander scheme of things the logic like, of it I, is that aizen wants to use her powers orihime has this one power where it's not healing but it's essentially reversing time on time objects so she wants him or he wants her to use her powers on the MacGuffin so that it will be in a state that he can use it but that never happens um <laughs> yeah it, it's 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 discarded so quickly that it's just kind of like you could have just had him kidnap Orihime just because he wants Ichigo to be mad at him like that's also a completely valid reason to have that there or just but don't do it, it. it we're just don't yeah do it. It, it, it's it, it's very strange, and also it takes Orihime, who is a side character I like a lot, and really just relegates her to being, like, you know, damsel in distress, and just kind of turns her into a flatter, more boring version of herself in this arc. She's just kind of stoic, and kind of, she's, she's, Orihime is essentially turned into Princess Zelda in this story arc, and it's just like, ah, I don't really know how I feel about that, and that's the thing is that I agree with you is that fundamentally I don't really have a problem with them doing a repeat of Soul Society. The problem is that you have to do it as well as you did it before. And I want to say there are lots of things about Hueco Mundo that I really like. Uh, first and foremost, the setting itself. Um, it's not as well defined as the Soul Society. It's not as intricate. There's not as many moving parts. There's not the, the, the history of that place doesn't feel like it weighs it down in the way that soul society does that said i love it visually it lets kubo play with a lot of really sort of stark very you know like it has that kind of really heavy contrast black and white feel on it and it allows him to lean into the stranger sensibilities of his art style that were certainly there before, but everything here is way more stylized and angular looking. And it just, it feels very like it's, I know that all manga is black and white, but the monochromatic nature of the setting feels like a distinct advantage to me just because it allows for an interesting like sort of visual contrast because the rest of bleach is you know adequately colorful and looks a certain way whereas here it really plays up the strengths of his individual style and i like that and throughout the entire show kubo's character designs are fucking heat for like just all of them are great and that has like no exception here like the iran car are all awesome like everyone like like, like design wise i mean like halle bell one of the best designs he's ever made grim Jow, one of the best designs he's ever made and some of them are just fucking freaks freaks weird Aro Niero and zomari oh. rewatch are way better than I remember them being as characters than back Araniero in the especially super super fucking like weird shit that like honestly it reminds me more of Oda's One Piece designs than it looks like traditional like Kubo designs and they work they all work it's it's and they have a sort of unified theme of having the sort of holified versions of themselves and it's cool um, there's also just distinct characters and moments that do allow themselves interesting moments to shine. Um, when the captains show up in Hueco Mundo, specifically Mayuri and Kenpachi, um, that shit's awesome. Uh, Mayuri has that moment. <laughs> Mayuri has the moment where he he kills his own fake uh pl plot version because of course they have a weird mad scientist character who sacrifices his uh underlings exactly like Mayuri and the way Mayuri kills him is the most bizarre like existentially horrifying <laughs> shit where he like makes him take this drug that has him perceive time differently so that every second is like thousands of years and just stabs him slowly through the hand and into his heart and he feels himself dying for an eternity and it's like dude you, you went really hard on this one guy's death 
<laughs> for like no reason and then there's like when kentachi shows up to, to to beat fucking ass on that number five motherfucker who looks Skill guy. Yeah. so yeah he is so weird he's so weird one of the strangest character <laughs> designs i have ever seen oh and um uh, not to mention in terms of like the antagonist i don't think they get like near as much development and intrigue as the soul society captains but the ones that do get a decent amount green Zhao in particular i'm a particularly big fan of i like his sort of origin story and the contrast it has with ichigo and sort of how they view relationships with people and that green Zhao is as strong as he is because he sacrificed and consumed all of his friends to become an apex predator essentially and whereas ishigo that's the direct antithesis to how he views the people in his life and how he's become stronger so them fighting is like grim is an effective uh version of renji in this essentially but uh done in a different way a, a different enough way for me anyway and there are other characters that get certain spotlights um uh oh, what's what's the the little the, the child what's her name no i can't ever nell nell yell uh who doubles down on the yoroichi twist of being an adorable character with nell yeah Mm. who's an adorable small child who ichigo has to take care of who guides him through uh hueco mundo who eventually turns into an insanely hot woman okay like cool i guess but also what and then she turns out to be like one of the turncoats. But again, yeah, she's Yoroichi, uh, essentially. Uh, not quite as cool and less gay. So naturally less cool. Uh, and then there's everybody's favorite. Ukiora. Um, Hot take. Basically. Uh, Ukiora, not he's... great. <laughs> well, Ukiora is everyone's favorite because he's got a great character design. And. He does, but also it's like it's kind of fine. Like his final form is cool, but it's also like he's it's it's just he's just kind of like an emo dude. Like he just looks like Gerard Way. We don't and like that's fine. It's cool. I mean, I've talked about how characters in the show being static can work to the cast's benefit overall. But my issue with Okiora is that he's not around enough. We never really figure him out. Yeah. And so that moment when, like, Grim Jow, who we do know a lot about by this point, like, basically goes after Okiora to kill him just so that he can have the honor of fighting Ichigo. And you think that's what yeah. it's going to be. But then Ichigo just kills Grim Jow and has to fight Okiora anyway. And the most dramatic thing that Okiora does is reveal that all the Espadas. Well, no, not all of them. That he's figured out how to do a bankai, and he's the only one who knows how yeah. to do it. And it's like, and yeah, then Ichigo goes full, goes full hollow against him, and that's how he beats him. And it's like, it's the most it's visually. Like with, I think people remember it so fondly because it's the most visually interesting fight, possibly of the whole show. Just the character yeah, designs. I would say so. And the fight itself and the way they clash with each other, it lends itself really well to, like, fan art and AMV core. Oh, yeah. And none of the it, other I mean, fights you in the see, show really do. You see Ukiora and instantly you're just like, oh, you're you're a Tumblr sexy man. Like, it's just it's it's just so obvious. You see him and it's just like, oh, every every everyone who watched this show who could potentially find a pretty boy attractive. It's like, oh, I could fix him. That's Ukiora. And I, look, I, I get it. But they essentially try to make him, bo- like dramatically, they make him both the Byakuya and the Kenpachi, except that he doesn't have the personality of either. And even Byakuya, who's just kind of cold and stoic, you find out why he's the way he is eventually. With Ukiora, not really. The, the, the attention just isn't... Like, even some of my favorite members of the Espada, like Holly Bell, for instance, who doesn't really get a chance to shine until Fate Karakura to town, um, you're just kind of like... I mean, you're cool looking, but, like, also... What? And then there's also... um. 
the, the 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 one moment I object to a bit on just the basis of abject stupidity is the uh the fight with that uh fucking Rukia has in, in this arc. Yeah, um, that here's the thing. It, this, this freak <laughs> Aroniero disguises himself as Rukia's old captain that she killed because he mm-hmm. was infected by a hollow he disguises himself as the old captain and that's a moment that should work except the deception part of that fight goes on for like three episodes intercut with other fights and rukia Uh completely falls for it and it's it 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 would work if it didn't go on forever well you know that's the thing is that in the static way that it's played correct but if they wanted to introduce a moment, like, they should have, A, had Rukia be way more skeptical of his intentions from the outset, and B, play it as kind of a will-he-won't-he of being, like, maybe he helps them a little bit, but there's also a, a, an aspect of consistent doubt that, like, maybe he's luring her into a trap, but maybe he also does enough for her and for, like, everyone infiltrating uh, Hueco Mundo that they all start to trust him perhaps and then if he actually had a moment where he proved out to be a turncoat it would actually hold water yeah, maybe he does and what he does really in the society where he holds off against a couple of the other espadas then turns on them but like that interaction and that deception never leaves that room and so it just feels like a waste of time no. Yeah, like, in my head, like, that moment is so disconnected from the rest of Hueco Mundo that it feels like its own OVA that happened completely separately from the rest of the plot. And that's kind of an issue that it has, is, like, even when characters got broken up in the Soul Society, you still got the the impression that everyone was moving through the same environment, whereas Hueco Mundo is so large and so surreal-looking that when any given person is in a different place, they might as well be on a different planet than the rest of the other characters. You can't really feel the effects of one place happening on the other. So, like, when, you know, Chad gets the ever-loving tar beaten out of him after he reveals that he has two arms now, ha-ha! Uh, that moment is just kind of like, oh, okay, he's getting jobbed again. Thanks. Uh, and it, it just kind of concludes with a next time on the next Bleach arc. Yeah, I mean, it concludes like... with, it essentially concludes with the Okiora fight and the reveal that Aizen has basically let them have this scuffle as a diversion for breaking into Karakura Town, except we knew that was going to happen. So we set up this elaborate contraption and we have a fake Karakura town that's actually in the Soul Society that doesn't make much sense, but sets up a cool um, extended battle arc, I guess you would call it. Which yeah. Which is the next arc, the fake Karakura town arc. It's It's certainly elaborately strangely set up to just be like oh we have to make a new karakura town to trick aizen into going to the wrong karakura town it's like that seems like a it seems like you went about solving this problem in the <laughs> it feels most like, strange way possible it feels like from a writing perspective kubo had the idea of that one episode where Aizen is just walking around the streets of Karakura Town scaring all of Ichigo's high school friends and had to come up with a really <laughs> elaborate way to get everybody into Karakura Town. <laughs> yeah. And and that's when, like, it, things depart a little bit just because this is basically a huge extended, like, just long battle sequence between basically everyone we've met from the Soul Society and everyone we've met from Hueco Mundo. And this, this is a difficult thing to talk about just because this is almost nothing but fighting. Like, just, like, continuously the whole time between various characters. It's a war. I mean, it's like the last yeah. match of Naruto. Like, a full-on war breaks out, and it takes up, like, yeah. the last third of the story. <laughs> And it's a bit disappointing that something so climactic is happening in a setting that's so familiar at this point. I almost feel like they should have just 
set up some sort of new dimension that they would go into just for the sake of visual contrast because like it, it kind of wears out its novelty very quickly of it's just like oh it's everyone fighting in Karkura town and it's like yeah but nothing's really like the, the the visual symmetry between this and the first arc of the show there's there's nothing really like communicated in this being like oh look how far everything has come it's just like no this is just a suburban setting for them to fight inside and it's like all right that's that's fine whatever but like i think sometimes that works there is that key moment where aizen has actually broken through and he's interacting yeah. with real people and that part of it works that's when kind of the anachronism of the the weirdness of the premise with the urban setting um comes mm. full circle but that is like a sliver compared to how long yeah it actually goes on should have been played into a lot more and it also just feels so disconnected it's like yeah i get it to some extent you just kind of want to have a battle arc that closes out everything and i'm not opposed to that in theory but it also feel like it just severely limits the stakes of the show to just be like it's it's just immediately what's in front of you. With everything else, even in Puerto Mundo, it feels like you knew the greater consequences of what every fight was going to be on some level. You're just like, okay, I get what the macro and micro of all of this is. Whereas here, it's just kind of like, nah, it's 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 this, and it's basically nothing but this. And if you're going to end your story, that's fine. But this is not the end of Bleach. <laughs> uh, far... Far from it. In I fact. mean, that's not that's uh, not this arc's fault that it's not the end of the story no. per se. But in retrospect, it, it, that does yeah. weaken it even a little bit more, knowing that this is now essentially the middle of the story. <laughs> it 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 ends up feeling like the least consequential of all of the arcs to me, especially because the end of it, with the biggest sort of most dramatic consequence coming when of course ichigo fights aizen which is you know th this is a moment we've been building to for a while and kubo loves him some retcons so it's of course we're going bag, to have the... but i, I want to save extended discussion on that for a second i think my favorite thing about fake karakura town though is that it's a it's a pretty good battle arc for what a battle arc is i mean no. there's a lot of really satisfying so character hard. interactions and individual moments and legitimate tactics unlike anything we've seen in the show so far um oh, and yeah. characters get elaborated on that we've never seen before you know the visors have a lot more to do um shinigami that we haven't seen since hueco mundo all of a sudden are playing principal roles in this one day of war um and just there's a lot of really good individual moments that build on each other to a mix of a climax but watching all these episodes moment to moment because like i said th these are my first episodes of the show there's mm. still a lot to love i mean from no a totally nerd perspective kubo figures out a lot of fun shit to do there's one visor whose big thing is that he can do like barriers basically yeah fighting a guy we didn't really elaborate on this eisen has a small battalion of these people called espadas who are essentially hollows trying to become more like soul reapers they have their own form of zanpak toe that are slightly different where instead of swords their release they're the squad captains of like they're they're the evil squad captains basically yeah. they they function slightly different from, from a visual perspective in that their power releases change their physical forms more than just their swords like i think of the yes. contrast of like toshiro's bankai with barrigan's release where he essentially turns yeah. into like a, a skeleton king a skeleton thing. man with a big axe with a big axe and it's a really cool contrast that you really do feel that logic that like oh these are hollows and soul reapers and this is how their powers are going to work slightly differently but barrigan is fighting this dude or hachi is fighting this dude called barrigan who's and all the espadas are related to death in some way and barrigan's thing is all about like the inevitable rot and so he has this aura that essentially it's like the opposite of Orihime's powers where it decays 
yeah. anything it touches it'll like turn you to bones and then your bones fly away but Hachi <laughs> figures out how to like put him into a barrier that his um aura can't escape from and then Soifan in like what's just a really funny character detail Ooh. her Bankai is just a rocket launcher <laughs> <laughs> it's so metal uses, that she never uses because it's so against how she fights and she just hates doing it <laughs> which is a really cool character detail and that's what you get a lot of in fake car Town. it's just like cool small character moments that build on each other like we get to see toshiro and rondiku and momo all kind of interact together you get to see the visors interact together in a way that we haven't seen before you get to see the leader of the visor, Shinji, who is, is he a former? Yes, he is a former captain. Yeah, he is. Face Eisen finally, which is not a moment that they've really built up to. But no. just the way they execute that and the attitude that he brings to that fight is so satisfying to see. Because he, like Kisuke, thinks he's devised some really intricate way to beat Eisen thanks to his powers. And Eisen just wipes the floor with him nope <laughs> bye well not in an instant because that is my favorite part of fake karakura town is when everyone has kind of beaten their initial fights that have had a lot of really satisfying emotional moments and technical moments because this is when a lot of fun new powers get unveiled everybody turns all mm-hmm. their fun new powers onto aizen and you think for one episode that it's maybe going to work. And then he does, Kubo does the most fucked up thing, which is that <laughs> Aizen has gotten into everyone's minds already. And he's made all of them attack Momo. And it's the best Poor thing Momo. because Ichigo shows up and they've set up this thing where in like, you know, this probably isn't going to work. But they have this plan where like Ichigo is maybe possibly the only person not affected by Aizen Zanpakuto and they're right and they find out in the worst way possible (laughs) this I think is shows Kubo's growth I think as a storyteller in this particular aspect is that it really does feel like there is an emphasis on the tactics and the sort of pre-established characters it it relies on you being invested way more than the other arcs do they sort of build from the ground up with a little bit more but that being said if you're this far into the story you either are or aren't invested enough to care at this point so your mileage is going to vary but this is very much the the part of the story that feels like it depends on what comes before it the most, but also pays the most dividends. So it's like the arc that maybe you put the most, it like relies on you to sort of enjoy it based on what you bring with you. So if you are invested, I think that this is a worthwhile piece of storytelling. If you are already kind of shaky with Bleach, this is not going to do anything to change your mind. But as somebody who does, you know, give a shit about all this nerd crap, I can't help but have a good time with it. Uh, Even in... uh, I I don't want to say that, like, it's the ending of this is maybe controversial, but I've certainly seen more negative takes on it than positive ones. And in hindsight, I can certainly see why that this not being the end of bleach really hurts it in a lot of ways. But I do think that people sort of miss the dramatic crux of what it all tends to mean in the moment. Because when Ichigo finally stands off against Aizen, you know, in a macro sense, it does kind of end with a bit of an ass pull. That said, the consequences of the ass pull, I think, make it worthwhile, yeah. at least in as so far as it affects that moment. Because, like, in theory, it's basically Ichigo giving up his powers and all of his strength that he's earned throughout the entirety of the show, which is a lot, to defeat Aizen and essentially never be able to use it again. And 
for Ichigo, a character who is defined by the fact that he is scared to lose the people around him, that he's been focused on saving his friends, you know, he's been, you know, he had that in sort of central inception of the grief of his mother leading to him being paranoid about losing other people and wanting to be stronger so that he could protect other people. He's giving up all of the power that he's earned, and he has to secede to being a normal human and accepting the normal human consequences of death. And dramatically, I think that's great. I think that is fantastic. And it's just slightly undercut by the fact that the story keeps going after this point. And like, some people are just like, oh, it's just an ass pull that comes from the fact that we kind of glazed over the fact that Ichigo's dad is a soul reaper. But uh, that that's one of the many instances of obvious retcons where Kubo's just like, I mean, sure, why the fuck not? Also, Ichigo's mom is a Quincy, and it's like... I was say, that happens much later. <laughs> I pretty much, don't. Pretty much everybody we meet in the initial arc is not who we thought yeah. that they were, you know. <laughs> Ichigo's dad is secretly a soul reaper. We find that out relatively soon in the grand scheme of things. It's not quick, a complete quick ish. Quick -ish. It's not a complete left turn. Um, he does serve a lot in that last arc, but the the I think for me, what sours the emotional um beat of Ichigo losing his powers is not just that the story isn't over and so retroactively it kind of undercuts that moment a bit, but because that's when after an arc so filled with Kubo at his best in terms of staging and tactics and yeah in such a cool nerd way the way they actually execute this whole thing comes out of nowhere Ichigo has to do another training thing with his um <laughs> Zanpakuto and hollow self to get a new special power to have it even a slight chance of beating the bad guy and then that doesn't even work because kisuke ends up having to finish him off um which they never really ruminate on at all Th that could even be a compelling moment where like i did all this i gave all this up and it didn't even work and somebody else had to do it for me like that has potential of being like a i would have i would have liked that a lot more if it ended up being someone you know what it would have been cool is it would have been cool if it was momo <laughs> but, <laughs> well, Kisuke and Eisen that that that, that, that was would great as well. But no, my, yeah, absolutely. My larger point is that it's when in an arc full of cool, nerdy, technical anime planning out how things are gonna go down. Shit, the actual final gets a good ten show feels like he doesn't know what to do. Yeah, it's just like, uh, yeah, sure, might as well do this thing, I guess. And it's like, I, I, it, it really does feel like Kubo just kind of hit a wall with these two paragons of strength in the narrative and just didn't know how to do that. And that's a problem that especially feels more potent now that I've explored other, I mean, I keep coming back to the Hunter x Hunter comparison, but it's like, Togashi is a guy whose bread and butter is made off of making this nerd shit exactly what you want and making it woven into the dramatic stakes in a way that feels logical, sensible, satisfying. And here it just doesn't have that. And with that buildup of the rest of the arc, it makes you really, it prepares you for what you feel like is good going to be a satisfactory conclusion because you feel like in your head it's like oh he solved all these problems with his writing so like retroactively you're like oh he, he's he got it he's got it and then he just kind of trips at the end and it's it's not wholly like bad or anything it just it leaves a bad taste in your mouth i think bleach would have been much better off as a cultural milestone of like the last era of cable tv pre-streaming anime if it had just ended here still warts and all it would probably be more well liked than it is maybe not like anymore. um like naruto yeah maybe not like any more than it's for, for, for naruto's many problems honestly it's like I would actually argue that narratively speaking, in some of the later arcs of Naruto, Naruto commits way more sins than Bleach does. But I was I'm not as big of a Naruto thing. fan. Like, 
Naruto but, like, has a lot the more way... steps in its last act that frankly like, Bleach does not. Well, that's have. the thing is that Naruto is the inverse in that like all of the build up to the finale of Naruto is like like I just could not give a shit. And then the final fight with Naruto and Sasuke is perfect. Incredible. <laughs> it's fucking like I got misty eyed over a show that I would give like a six out of ten. Like I'd be like, oh, this is fine. And then the final fight is fucking incredible. And also they get way more creative and inventive with the animation than they do here, which is good. I should stress that, but they do hit that peak in Hueco Mundo between Ukiora and Ichigo, which is a fight that I just don't care about as much as Ichigo and Aizen. It just doesn't have the stakes that this one has. And it's it's fine. It looks nice, but there's nothing about it that makes you go, whoa, holy shit, like you do in the final fight of Naruto and the two characters are charging at each other and you see them as the younger version of themselves and then gradually they sort of age until they fight in the center of the screen. You're just like, that's an amazing visual idea and none of that's really here. Ichigo, or Bleach can never, and maybe Thousand Year Blood War will change my mind, Bleach will never meld that technical and emotional narrative that of the fights in the story Mm -hmm. that its contemporaries do even despite their own problems i mean naruto is better at that my hero is better at that dragon ball is better at that like there are times where in either (sighs) where in one of the other it exceeds its contemporaries but it never like finds a good blend of the two to surpass any that of the I, great moments from those stories that we still talk about. I completely agree. Like, that's a lot of the reasons as to why I think I it stuck with me as long as it has, is that the parts of Bleach that I think it does well and that it does better than its contemporaries are the parts that speak to me specifically. And that's why, like, I've never liked Naruto as much. Like, I've just, the the characters have just never been for me, but I've still, like, watched the vast majority of it. And it's like, when it hits those highs and when it hits those sort of technical moments that blend it with the emotionality of it, it's just like, you're never going to hear anybody talk about any fight in Bleach the way people talk about Rock Lee versus Gara. Like, there's there's nobody yeah. who remembers ukiora and ichigo fighting the way they do sasuke and naruto and then once you get older the inevitable tragedy of the big three of shonen is that you just get older and you're just like oh man one piece is just so much better than both of these (laughs) like one piece has everything there is no like the only thing holding one piece back is the fact that it's longer than 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 god like all i of these it's, it's, toge- it's all of these things that we spend all day arguing about put together is just the length of one piece <laughs> and frankly i would rather yes, argue and, about smaller things <laughs> sometimes well and that's the thing is that with one piece there's also just inherently less to criticize because the world in one piece is like that's the cool thing is that as I've gotten older and that I've gravitated towards it more is that like One Piece's world is like if Soul Society was just the entirety of Bleach. It's 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 an interconnective sort of network of continuing cause and effect that affects like that just you feel the ripple effects of every single decision in that entire fucking narrative. And the fact that it's as long as it is, is is nuts. And that's what makes returning to shows like Naruto and like Bleach difficult is because there's so many advancements in stories like that since that like if you wanted to get into one of these things and you want to sink a lot of your time into this shit get into One Piece because that's about to be over and literally everyone I know who's into One Piece is just like, no, this story just literally just gets better and better as it goes on. And that's not an advantage that these others have. (laughs) What now? I'm an angry One Piece fan. (laughs) Because because they would have given up because if One Piece had stumbled for even a second, people would have jumped ship. 
pun not intended <laughs> but they would have they if, if one piece had at any point become any less compelling than it started out with or it didn't give you a reason to keep reading it's like this is fucking five thousand chapters i no one has the time for something that isn't going to be the best thing they ever read and that's why i can sort of understand why bleach is given the least due of the big three is that because for as many amazing moments as it has, and for as much as I love those moments, it's it feels like it is a fundamentally kind of unsatisfying venture. And I feel like this builds into the arc that comes after uh, Fate Karakura Town, because this, to me, feels like a conscious attempt to course correct from Kubo. I don't know if maybe he was just aware of the fact that he had run into some problems when he had Ichigo and Aizen fight, or if maybe he paid attention to some fan feedback, or if diminishing sales had something to play into this, but it really does feel like everything from here on out is him trying to build on what maybe he wasn't great at before. Which leads us into the full Bringer arc. And the worst thing about the full Bringer arc is that it's good for like 90 percent of it <laughs> oh man it's so true thing about it i was texting you in a frenzy one day as i was watching the last few episodes of just like program. why is this good and i, I was, literally said I why is this these good texts. because every i was sitting I here reading them. your text and i was like I know where this is going. I can't I can't be the one to break this to them. I feel so bad. Every memory I have of the Fullbringer arc reading the manga back in the day was that it's a waste of time. It's not good. Just skip it to get to the Thousand Year Blood War. But it's still canon, so I'm gonna fucking watch it. And this is what happens in the Fullbringer arc. There's once again a new group of new characters with new powers that may or may not have ulterior motives for Ichigo, but want to help him get more powers. Um, the main... Not essentially I... his powers back, but they have this weird system where they draw the innate spiritual energy from objects and use that as their power? Yes, they have, they have a plan. They have a different magic system... That comes from, they explain it as they were in the womb when their mothers were attacked by hollows. So they have a mm -hmm. very unique connection to the spiritual energy of the world. And it manifests in their ability to draw out souls from objects. And a bunch of them have really cool gimmicky powers. And then there's Ginjo, who's boring. But anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Gicho has an alarmingly boring character design as well like he is literally just a guy he's just a dude especially compared to all these other fucking freaks and their fucking freak <laughs> powers <laughs> but anyway yep. their goal is that they want to reawaken Ichigo's power by giving him awakening his full bring through a bunch of really odd training montages and we figure out in a retcon that I honestly don't mind that Chad also is a full bringer and that's where his powers came from. Yeah. Which that I don't mind. I don't mind that either. It lets us spend more time with Chad too, which is nice. I like that he's mm -hmm. I like that he's in this more than or he may in, or you are. Um, I agree. But the main problem with the full bring arc is that it has a twist. That I'll explain in a second. But the good thing about the Fullbringer arc is that for a second, it has a really intimidating villain in this dude named Tsukishima, who, and I have to explain, this is a time skip after the end of Fate Karakura Town. Our characters are all still in school, but they've all kind of mm -hmm. grown apart a little bit after what's happened. Ichigo is working now outside of school to support his family, which is keeping him away from his friends. They kind of they have legitimately compelling arguments and they feel distant in ways that are really sad and feel really real to see. For characters I like that a lot. To make a larger point about these characters, the difference in Ichigo and other shonen protagonists is that at the end of the day, 
he's a kid who just wants to go home. Like Naruto, and that's wants- why I like him the most out of all of the shonen protagonists. Like him is that he's a person who, like, yeah, like the fighting is not his goal. Getting stronger is a means to an end, you know. Yeah, and he's always felt that way about his powers. Naruto wants to be the ninja president. Luffy wants to get the One Piece. <laughs> Goku wants to be the strongest man. Ichigo is just a kid who wants to be a kid and take care of his family and his friends. And if getting supernatural powers and going through hell is what he has to do to do that, then that's fine. But if he doesn't have to do that, he's just going to be a kid who's going to take a shitty job to take care of his sisters. And mm-hmm. that's what I love about him. And that's why that's also part of what I love about this arc. But anyway, this dude, Tsukishima, shows up and he has, similar to um, Mayuri, this fucking insane power that feels terrifying on like a Lovecraftian level where he Mm -hmm. alters your memories so that he becomes the most important person in your life. And it takes a while to figure that out. And when it do- when you do figure out that that's what's going on, it's already too late. There's a great episode where we all kind of find out that Chad and Orihime have both been attacked by him. This power kind of takes in, it's kind of like an infection, like it happens sort of slowly. Um, yeah. Chad and Orihime kind of figure out what's going on and go fight him. And then the powers kind of take full effect. And so you see old episodes of the show where you think initially he's just going to be replacing Ichigo, but it goes even beyond that where you see like flashbacks that we saw in the substitute arc reused where Tsukishima is taking place of, and it's the same shots. Tsukishima is Mm -hmm. taking the place of not just Ichigo, but Orihime's brother and Chad's Mm -hmm. grandfather as well. The and people who were the inception for them getting powers. Yeah, and it's horrifying. And it's so good. And the episode where Ichigo comes home just as he realizes that, like, hey, this Tsukishima guy, Ginjo is starting to kind of catch up to what's going on, and he warns Ichigo about it. And Ichigo comes home, and Tsukishima is just on his couch and everybody Chilling. is there like he's invited everybody like chad and orihime and even like the high school friends and his sisters and his dad have all been attacked by Tsukishima and show up to like throw a party and ichigo like tries to beat the shit out of him and everybody freaks the fuck out and it's it's so good it's so good it's so good <laughs> <laughs> but then but then but then in the last five episodes of the show which as you're watching it <sighs> and as you see that episode count like dread just kind of starts to fill your heart it's just like i didn't know if they can resolve this story arc this quickly with this amount of time and the answer is that is they, they can't <laughs> ginjo <laughs> is revealed to have been a bad guy the whole time. Tsukishima also has an ability to just slightly alter someone's memories in a different way and has like brainwashed all of the full bringers into forgetting who he is so that they'll draw Ichigo in and give him his power so that Ginjo who is actually an old substitute soul reaper can steal Ichigo's weird hybrid <clears throat> full bringer soul reaper powers to get his own weird hybrid full bringer soul reaper powers. It gets even worse when all of the captains just kind of show up uh... because they realize that something's been going on because there's another stupid twist that the substitute soul reaper badges are um what's that thing that are basically 
the Patriot Act. Um, <laughs> oh, oh God. Oh, that's you, funny. You figure out that it, <laughs> you figure out that Soul Society basically did a Patriot Act on the substitute Soul Reapers, except by the way it's explained, it sounds like Ginjo and Ichigo are the only substitute Soul Reapers to ever exist. So why would Ginjo phrase it like that and not just say they've been watching you this whole time and not that they watch everyone? Like that doesn't have an emotional impact when the only people affected by that are the two of you. <laughs> and then there's another twist where Ichigo is just like, yeah, I already knew about the Patriot Act, but I don't care. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> the ramifications of 9-11 and the Bleach universe go are, are wide-reaching. And then, and then, and oh. then all the captains show up because like, hey, Ichigo, we did the Patriot Act and realized that you were in trouble. So now we're here to fight all these dudes and everyone has super lame fights except for Byakuya and Tsukishima who have a fucking awesome Yaki and fight. and Tsukishima's fight is so dope. It has no business being it that has hard. no business being that good. Um, and then... Ichigo just kind of kills Ginjo. The captains all just kind of leave, and the story just kind of ends. And <clears throat> this is not the anime's fault because, I mean, the manga kept going, and Thousand Year Blood War picked up right after that. But if we're just looking at this from an anime perspective, which I have been doing, this is the weirdest fucking structure for a shonen anime I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> It is, like, it, I, I can't stress how out of nowhere this, like, final act of the story comes. It And I think a lot of the the worst part of it is that if you read the manga, it's just kind of the same thing, but longer. Everything about the emotional mechanics of this story get completely lost. Like, everything about the ending of the Fullbringer arc is about trying to wrap things up from a logical perspective, and they barely get there. But they just completely forget that the things that happen in the stories like this are, like, supposed to mean something to you. Like, it's supposed to advance the narrative of the characters. It's supposed to do something for them. And the frustrating thing is that I, like you, really like the grasp that this has on its characters and the way that they've drifted apart at the very beginning of the arc. I feel like there's something really potent and really emotional about that that they really could have taken advantage of and really kind of built into the nature of how this story in its macro sense is about being able to move on. And they just don't do that. They just, they, it's, it just becomes about an anime with people with swords that need to fight the other people with swords and then the people with swords that are good win and then the people with swords that are bad lose and then they stop using swords and it's like oh i mean there's an easy way okay. to, not not to be a youtuber but there's an easy way to rewrite <laughs> this and fix it which is just have chad and orihime and uriu in the final fight <laughs> except that requires killing Tsukishima first because Chad and Orihime have been brainwashed. But fine, why doesn't why don't Ginjo and Tsukishima just let Chad and Orihime take care of Ichigo and Uryu if you have the powers now and all you need to do is kill these two people? Why not have the two people who don't matter to you do it? For you and have like character conflict between the characters we actually give a shit about and not the side characters who are not at a developed point much at all like Kenpachi shows up and it's practically a joke how quickly he wins his fight um you no know, it is a joke in the anime it basically is a joke yeah There's one old 
Alfred Pe- Pennyworth looking motherfucker who turns into the Hulk <laughs> and then Kibachi yeah. just slices him in half. Dead. And that's it. And I didn't remember that this happened and I was waiting for him to like regenerate so the fight would go on because that happens in fucking Bleach all the time. It doesn't happen. Every fight somebody thinks that they've won and then the other guy reveals some secret power. But that doesn't happen and Kenpachi just like walks away. And it's it's exhausting. It's the shortest arc of the whole thing. And it's exhausting to get through because they were so close to making a good art i I, got so lost in the muck i think part of the thing too is that i just think having ginjo do a heel turn is a mistake in the first place i just don't understand why tsukishima wasn't the end game from this arc from the outset i just kind of feel like that twist exists so arbitrarily it's just him trying to you know recapture the magic of the aizen twist in the soul society arc yeah because for the sake of it it's just like, logically, it, it's like, there's a reason for it, sure, but I feel like there's an easy way you can write this into being more compelling or just even temporarily sidelining Ginjo of just, like, narrative importance because it's just, like, once that heel turn happens, Tsukushim is just like, oh, yeah, you're here too, I guess. Like, Yeah, they, what? they do admittedly have this refreshing banter about them that no other characters in the show have where it's like they had to come up with this convoluted plot of erasing Ginjo's memory because they knew Ginjo wouldn't be able to deceive Ichigo long enough. (laughs) Which is kind of funny, but like, it's still really stupid from a story perspective. Like, (laughs) why isn't Tsukishima just the villain? Why isn't it about our four characters that we actually care about? Why doesn't Tsukishima just kill all the full bringers and just want to kill uh, and ichigo. having ichigo fight his friends after being distanced from them would be really dramatically kind of cool you get to see these people who've been together since day one have to use their powers on each other and the thing is is that that's where bleach ended and it felt like a kind of you know it, it felt like spitting on you while you're on fire because you already had the kind of disappointment of the end of Karakura Town lingering with everyone for a plethora of reasons some people take issues with different parts of it I think as we've demonstrated but then you have the Fullbringer arc which sort of lures you back in and just being like oh okay let's do something with this and then you fumble the bag even harder so it, it just sort of leaves the worst taste in your mouth. And then, and then, Kubo gets this kind of redemption story in and of himself, and that he starts a new arc, which is the Thousand Year Blood War arc, which absolutely catapult Bleach's manga sales back into, like, being relevant again. Like, the, the fall-off in terms of success of this manga has been... You know, it's been in a pretty steep decline. Like the Fullbringer arc had, you know, it brought things back for a little while, but it petered off really quickly. But then the Thousand Year Blood War arc came back and everyone sees this as a return to form. And that's what yielded this getting an anime adaptation. So that leaves us where we are today, where the Thousand Year Blood War arc is now, the first part of it at least, is now out. And we have not seen it. So I guess that means that we will continue this journey uh, down the road after we watch the first part of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, which is, it's on Disney Plus, isn't it? Hulu as well. Hulu as well. So it's, and I can't, I can't accentuate how weird it is to be in 2022 and 2023 and have new bleach. Like, it just feels wrong. Like, Naruto is so odd. I mean, to be be fair to Kishimoto, Naruto at least got a spinoff that you can ignore, if you please, as I've chosen to do for the most part. Yeah, Um, uh, I I don't know a single person who's watched and enjoyed Boruto. I remember there was that one episode that got trending on Twitter that was basically just all the adults hanging out in town. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> this is nice. I guess I'm not watching this show. 
I I think with with Bleach, there's just there's a desire to see the potential being fulfilled now is that there's sort of always been the undercurrent of it not being able to live up to the Soul Society arc in terms of how well-rounded and complete that it is. And a lot of Bleach fans think that this is where it comes back around. I know the broad strokes of what happens in this story, and we don't know if they're going to change anything from the manga because the anime does change a couple of things uh in terms of just like the minutiae of the plot even though it's largely a loyal adaptation but we don't know how much they're going to change and i'm eager to see if they because i mean i my opinion of what i know of the manga of the thousand year blood war arc in terms of the broad strokes is that it's it largely i think about it what you think about the fullbringer arc just maybe slightly less intense and that i love a lot of it and then the ending just kind of poof but i don't know if they're gonna change anything about that which i'm eager to see because they might and they might not so in many respects i'm still holding out to see if maybe we can get a satisfactory conclusion in there perhaps because I mean, this has just been going on for so long. At this point, I feel like it's it would just... be nice for everybody if this if this anime is all that it like if it meets the potential. I mean, even if you just did the manga one to one, warts and all, with what little I've seen, because I'm avoiding spoilers, but with what little I've seen of the visuals. This looks like it's going to be a splendor to see unfold one way or the other. <laughs> I th- This is the first time where I've seen Bleach animated stuff that like has legitimately been like, oh, this is impressively put together. Like the the best looking thing in these like across, you know, Bleach's many incarnation so far other than the Ukiora fight is the fight scenes in the Hellverse movie. Um which we might talk about the movies eventually, uh, but that fight scene is great. And then I saw the, the 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 sort of trailer for the new Bleach stuff, and I was like... I remember sending... Re- real shit? <laughs> I remember sending that trailer that was really just a bunch of, like, disconnected one-second stills when it came out, and we were both like, oh, this is going to be up to something. Not to mention, huh? it's... Not to mention it's called the Thousand Year Blood War arc, which is just the hardest a title has gone in, in in quite some time. Like you have a bunch of other arcs called like the Substitute, the Soul Society, Hueco Mundo, Fullbringer, the Bount arc, and then this is the Thousand Year Blood War, and I'm like, yeah, let's <laughs> go. <laughs> Uh, but we'll we'll get into the details of what the Thousand Year Blood War arc is, the story that it builds, uh, and what it's going to be when we cover that on the next part of this show, which will be coming eventually. Uh, give us some time, bitch. I don't know why I got aggressive no there at the end. As to our due dates, but we will get it done yes. because at the end of the day. We are nerds who want to do this. <laughs> it's true. It's tr- And hey, you know, by all means, I have seen many opinions on this show. Uh, I- I'm pretty sure that the I've seen the Super Eyepatch Wolf video on Bleach maybe 15 times. Uh, I-, I just like listening to that man talk. I, I like that Irish man's voice. Uh, but... Uh, I, I am well aware that many people can have many opinions on this show. So please, in the comments, tell us what you think of Bleach, of its various arcs, of its movies. If you want us to cover any of the tertiary shit, which is bad, but I will watch it if so <laughs> requested, because I'm a masochist. Leave and it in the comments and we'll Just because... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And because like the I, I I have a weird fondness for at least the aesthetics of the Bount arc, even though that arc is so fucking boring. But I will watch it again just because 
for the sake of completion because I'm a because I'm because I'm stupid because I'm dumb. But just to put it in perspective for you all, Do this it. did not happen overnight. Jake and I have been talking about this since <laughs> October. I have just been in the process oh, yeah. of rewatching oh, yeah. the whole show, and it's taken us this long to do. <laughs> I I haven't even gotten there. Like I've I've rewatched it more recently than when I first watched it, but I've still only seen like bits of the first part again. I I want to try and catch up, but I have a feeling I will probably just get through Soul Society and then just jump right into the Thousand Year Blood War arc, just because. Other stuff is a lot of episodes, and I, I, I know it well enough from my teen years. So, we will see you all again soon? Question mark. Next time on Rubber Gum. Anime Next Podcast. time on. <laughs> will Jen and Jake achieve their bonkai? <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm like when I was a child, I would be like, "Oh man, my fucking uh, my bonkai is it'll turn into like a dragon and pre fire." Now I'm like, I don't know. Can my bonkai be that I go to bed on time? Can my bonkai <laughs> be getting eight full hours of sleep? I would like that very much. Goodbye, <sighs> <Bye>, everybody. <laughs>